Okay, so once we get past a few basic examples, we start to run into an issue. And the issue is, well, it's all well and good to make threads and have them do things. But, I mean, especially in game development, we don't want to allocate a thread for a single job and then leave it because there's overhead in making threads. So what we really want to do is have a persistent thread which can interact with our environment. But having threads working on data can lead to bad cases. Um, the classic example is a race condition. So what I'm going to do in this video is set up a race condition and then show how to fix it. So I'll just go through the standard setup. What I'm doing is I'm also including the timer module because I'm interested to see how this also affects performance. So I'll set up a class and since I'm setting up a race condition, I'll call this a racer. What this is gonna do is have a pointer to some sort of shared state and it's gonna operate on that state. It's gonna modify the state and yeah, it'll be nice and simple, quite minimal. Okay, so there it is. We just loop through 10 times. We dereference the pointer. In other words, modifying the underlying memory. Cool. So now let's set up a function which will make a bunch of these and run them. Okay, we've got that. So I guess most of the code here was this uh, timing code, but don't worry, it's the same code. We can drop it in at any point to test the duration of something. So, okay, in the previous video, I made a note about how you can detach a thread and then sort of synchronize it with other means. Uh, I found that that was unstable. And I also found that you can, so long as so long as we're saving the thread somewhere, for instance, in this vector, we can let the let the um, function go out of scope. It's just it'll it'll lose reference to the state, um, if that makes sense. Because this is a standard library thing. If I make a thread, if I declare a thread, and then I don't store it somewhere, when it goes out of scope it gets destroyed and that's an issue because it hasn't been joined. But if we store these somewhere, for instance, in a vector and the vector stays in scope, then the threads are still running and that is stable. So in terms of the previous video, this is stable. Let's give it a shot. Let's see how it works. Huh. I'll just drop this into a new project. I don't think I don't think there's anything wrong with this code per se. I may I may mumble over my words, but I think there we go. Yeah, no, it was just the the template that I had. Okay, cool. So awesome. So it takes five milliseconds, and we get a result of eighty. That's what we'd expect because we're making eight threads, 
and they are incrementing 10 times each. Okay, so we can say, all right, um, as the size of our program increases, I mean, this is, this is still reasonable. We will reach a point where it starts to fail. It may even work here. Yeah, 8,000, that's pretty good. Uh, let's go one, two, three, one million times each thread. So I'd expect eight million as my result. Uh-oh. Now I don't. Now I've got 1.3 million. Huh, let's try that again. 1.32 million. It's different every time. So this is a race condition. We have the threads and the threads are doing their thing. They're continually accessing a variable. And when we just do it a few times, this may not show up, but when we do it an increasing number of times, the probability increases that two threads are gonna access the same number at the same time. So if the number is three and two threads grab it at the same time, they both set it to four. They both write it back as four, but what they should be doing is setting it to four and then the other one setting it to five. So we get a total which is less than it should be. So in order to deal with this, we need a mutex. Now a mutex stands for mutual excluder or mutual exclusion. Mutual exclusion is the principle that one thing is present or the other thing, but not both at the same time. So um, mutexes, are the general term. Some more specific terms could be locks or semaphores. So I'm going to redo this with the addition of a mutex. So I'll grab these structures and rename them. So this will be, I'll call this a guarded racer. So we're going to have we're going to have this as well as a mutex, which I'll call a semaphore. So yeah, mutexes, semaphores, locks, they're all pretty much, they work very similarly. I'm going to, I'm going to name them <laughs> the same way. So uh, let's grab a pointer to that because we're going to have a single semaphore for the whole thing. Okay, now the, the way this works is this semaphore will only be um, accessible to one thing at a time. So what we want to do when we start working with this data is we want to lock the semaphore. Now, if the semaphore is available, then we get it immediately and we lock it. If the semaphore is not available because thread B has grabbed the semaphore, then at this point, the code will wait until the semaphore is available, and then it will grab it and lock it, meaning that the thread, this thread, has exclusive access over this data. Alrighty, so after we've finished working, we unlock it, and now this will not be a race condition. This will be a safe race. Okay. So where were we? Uh, so we have this, we'll also have a pass that in. And yeah, that'll that's all we need to do. So again, what we're doing here is we create the we create the um, semaphore, and then we pass that in to every single thread. So every single thread has access to the common semaphore. It's best practice to make a single semaphore for a single resource that we want to control. If we if this wasn't a simple variable, but it was a whole um, class or instance or struct or something, then we might want to just set a single semaphore for that whole thing. It's up to you. And part of that is performance considerations. So previously, when the code was super buggy, it executed in about 
consistently to the order of 70 to 80 milliseconds. Not only do we get the correct result of 8 million, because we are guarding our data structure appropriately, but the execution time actually goes down. So it seems like maybe there are some issues when threads try to access the same data. Some messy stuff might be going on. And the reason we might want to the reason we might want to control the granularity of the locks is that if I grab and release a lock a million times, yeah, this gives other threads the opportunity to jump in. An individual thread might not be waiting so long in theory, but the truth is that there is some overhead in locking and unlocking. I mean, yeah, in this case, it sped things up right now it has actually slowed it down. So it's gone from 80 milliseconds to 465. That's not so good. So it's just something to be aware of. And the other thing to be aware of is if you have a really simple thread, which is only accessing things in, I don't know, what are some examples? So if you're accessing in read-only mode, or you're accessing data in write mode, but you have got a specific region of the data that you're writing to. Example, if you're making a ray tracer and you're just writing to fixed regions of the screen, then you actually probably don't need this stuff. Because what is it? Your ray tracer is reading data, so it's read-only mode, so there's no possibility of messing anything up. And the data that it's writing to has already been partitioned. But anyway, I'm rambling. So yeah, this has just been a little little primer on thread safety, race conditions, and things. And yeah, all the best. Have fun. And yeah, have a good one. Bye.